town is going to get more and more and more competitive. I think we are just starting to see competitiveness in India. And in the car industry, we are having two new players this year in addition to the total, I mean, on the largest number of players. So Damodaran is there in the aviation business and probably the most competitive business in India as well. So what, what do we, for me, staying ahead of the curve, like I said, staying on the curve itself is very difficult. And it's important to stay on the curve first before even if you can, before thinking of going ahead of the curve. And my philosophy, whatever I have learned over the years on staying on the curve and through a lot of my past mistakes, is really sticking to basics. It would have been a company that it is today. So the next big phase is innovation. Very hard to say how does one innovate. You need, of course, the basics in you. You need a process orientation and then a very creative mind. You need to understand what the market wants, what's reality and what is perception. Hopefully you can convert the perception into reality and stay ahead. Thank you very much for inviting me, Dinesh, and I hope you have a productive session this morning. Thank you, Vina. Can I now request the President to give a special address, please? CSR uh, uh, contributions every year. 
And I think that is also making it, uh, if I may say, CII to stand apart and its members, who are not only looking at being just a good corporate business citizen, but in totality a corporate citizen to look at inclusive global um, Let me uh, mention a few priority areas. I think one of the first things which comes to our mind and this we are struggling with is, is participation of youth. And participation of youth in productive um, initiatives, in productive areas, or taking in the economic growth of the country. And how do we bring about that? 8 to 10 million uh, young boys and girls are joining the workforce every year. And therefore, it is imperative, not only for the governments, not only for the academic institutions, but equally the industry, to make them employed. And I think uh, the, the one program which the government started in schools, under the Rashtri Madhavi Chichadya RMSA, to set up vocational training centers in schools, provi providing the vocational training in class 9, 10, 11, 12, module 1 and module 2. And the idea is to make the child employable after class 12. Um, given our population, uh, 1.3 million, 1.32 million, you can't have everyone an engineer, a doctor, or a scientist. So we need many more skills. The good thing is that today the children, even in the rural areas where we are running our educational initiatives, they, they actually come and tell me, don't give us vocational training on carpentry, electrician, and so jobs. Talk to us about financial services, fintech, retail, telecom. I think the aspirations are going through the roof. And therefore, it is important that industry now starts having a true partnership with the academia. I think we have a few members from the academia here as well. So I must reinforce my point which I have been pushing through the year. We have to step back as academic institutions just seeking support from the industry on summer training programs or come for annual uh, uh, hiring recruitments. Um, similarly, on the industry side, we just don't need to look at these two or give some funding on, on research. Uh, on R&D today, we are amongst the lowest spenders in the globe, even, in the, even within the emerging markets. I think the time has come when industry academia needs to sit on the table to talk about tweaking the curriculum. Talk about investing in research and development. And I can assure you industry is very, will be very happy to put money on the table as long as the academic institutions show them transparently where every rupee is being spent. The problem with academia is give us the money and forget about it, what we do. I don't think anyone is ready to do it. So all in all what I'm trying to say here is that so far in India we have been talking about jobs and future. I think we need to move to future of jobs. The world has moved. My engineering student in India, my medical student in India, when they finish their graduation or post-graduation, the world has moved. There is technology disruption every five years. So therefore, we need to talk about future technologies, artificial intelligence, internet of things, machine learning, robotics, augmented virtual reality. And this can only come through a strong partnership between industry and academia. So I think that's one, uh, I think, priority which I wanted to leave. The second uh, biggest priority is on agriculture, the farm sector, the farm stress we see. And this happens every few months, every few years. We need to come up with permanent solutions rather than looking at patchy solutions for the time being. And I believe farmer, farm sector, the farmers need tremendous support from the government. But that support shouldn't be only through subsidies. We can, we can augment the infrastructure, agri-infrastructure. We can augment the underground water table, which, which is depleting at, at an alarming rate. We can bring in online uh, transactions through the ENAM, Electronic uh, National Agri Market, which have been put up. And I think more importantly, when we, when we are looking at the eating habits of young India changing, I mean, many of you will agree with me, and the youngsters will positively who, who are sitting there. I mean, half the month it's a food uh, carry-out, uh, you don't want to cook, uh, just eat uh, home-cooked food. 
So the, the, the preferences are checked. So food processing is one big area. Agri-business and agri entrepreneurship is another. There are new models which are being thrown up. There are now shared mechanized services being provided by entrepreneurs, where they hire or buy the equipment, agri equipment, and lease out to the farmers because they don't have money to buy, and therefore our productivity suffers. One of the um, actually two very strong recommendations which CIA has made, and I have personally met the Honorable Prime Minister on this. One was on the leasing of agricultural land to the private sector, uh, including the large farmers who do today uh, leasing but under the table, uh, unethical ways of doing it. And once you start seeing large farms, you'll start seeing more mechanization happening, more drip irrigation, new technologies, new hybrid seeds. And by the way, that also ensures that thousands of farmers around that, uh, if I may say, the model farm or the the agriculture center of excellence starts getting, getting benefited because they start growing high value crop and don't have to worry about market. And the lease money today can actually be 40% upwards of the farmers in the which they earn every acre in a year. The second uh, um, strong recommendation which we have made and DTI has already uh, made their recommendations is to use solo as a third crop for the farm. And let me just take a minute because I think it's extremely important. Today, most of the state governments, and especially the agrarian states, are giving about 8,000 crore of rupees as power free subsidy, which is a billion dollar plus every year. <clears throat> In spite of that, the farmer is not happy because the power is available at night and not during the day when he is supposed to work. Um, so, one of the initiatives which the governments have started thinking of subsidizing solar pumps. The problem is the solar pump will have a life if not stolen or the panel will get uh, stolen and the farmer will be back on your post. So the, the recommendation which we have made is that if you allow the consolidation of land for putting solar farms which will come at a 14 feet high, farmer gets about 40,000 rupees per acre per year on the land lease. Which is one, which is uh, uh, half of what they are earning to be 80 percent. So that's a third crop which becomes for the farm, income for the farm. And by the way, the farming family continues to do agriculture economy. So it's not that they have lost their <coughs> agri business. Three basic benefits. The private sector puts the money on the solar farm, the farmer doesn't have it, the governments don't have to fund this. The farmer gets subsidized power during the day which makes the crop better productive and better quality. The government saves one billion dollar plus of power subsidy. And the additional subsidy we they want to give on solar power. So it's a permanent solution which we have recommended. And I hope most, more and more state governments push this. And since um, um, Dr. Subramanian is here, I think this is one thing which I would leave it for you to ensure that this we begin to move forward. Um, investment opportunities are huge across the country. I mean, you talk of agri sector, agri business, food processing, manufacturing, infrastructure. Um, I think these are the areas I don't have to sort of, uh, you know, spell out. Everyone of know uh, us know that we we have that opportunity. What we need to see is how can we move up the consumption? How can we look at the liquidity crunch issue getting resolved at the earliest, so that the SMEs get their credit? which they fail to get from the banks and the small borrowers who lean very heavily on the LBFCs. So I think that is some, uh, one another area which I believe uh, post the election there will be one big agenda for the government to ensure that this starts moving, moving forward. Um, in, the, in conclusion, <coughs> I can only say that uh, while Southern Region has uh, taken many, many more initiatives, CI has done that through the year. And through the centers of excellence, we provide uh, uh, outstanding services to the CI membership and others, be it on quality, be it on competitiveness, be it on green buildings. In fact, uh, India has the largest number of green buildings outside US in the world. And today, CI is engaging with the state government to make their existing buildings green. We have entered into an agreement with, uh, with Punjab and Haryana to ensure that some of their buildings we, we, we do it as a pilot and then take it forward. 
And I think these are the things which, uh, which CI does beyond policy advocacy, beyond raising industry issues. And I think more importantly, how can we look at bridging the uh, gap between small and medium enterprise and, and, and the big uh, uh, enterprises? How can we bring the Indian businesses on international forums and bring them into uh, large uh, companies globally to partner within India outside? And I think more importantly, CII's role as nation building. I think that is something extremely important and I'm sure we will not only continue that, uh, doing that agenda, but we will walk hand in hand and partner with the government in India to ensure that India finds its place under the sun. Thank you very much.
and youth is defined by its singular quality of impatience. What sets youth apart from the rest of us is impatience. Riding on impatience, there is an irreverence. We were reverential when we ought to have been merely respectful. They are neither reverential nor respectful. They ask tough questions uh, in a no old part fashion because they are such answers. If we had the right questions in our mind, we didn't ask them at that time. We kept it to ourselves because we thought we might offend something. That's not the case any longer. They also bring to the table a combination of energy, enthusiasm, excitement. And this is a heady cocktail. It either explodes into something positive or into something dangerously negative. And for those of us who are slightly older, and I say slightly, somewhat optimistically, uh, for those of us who are not young any longer, let me put it that way, uh, there is the responsibility to ensure that this great energy that there is in this nation, more than in most other nations because of our population profile, what we call our demographic dividend, we want to put this to great use. Now why is disruption taking place? It is because people are questioning the way things were done earlier. You want to do newer things to do today, you have to do things better today, you want to do things faster today, uh, you want to do things that are completely different from what you did earlier. No longer will this country tolerate what we've tolerated for years, for decades, which is incrementalism. You have to move away from incremental change to fundamental change. And that is something that industry must set an example for. We don't have to be followers, as the President said. At one time we were leaders in the political space, in the non-aligned movement, and then we became followers. We now discovered that there is a seat for us at the high table. The question is that having got to the high table, you got to stay at that high table by leading the country, leading persons that are less privileged than you are, and showing an example to the world that a country that is so heterogeneous, with multiple divides, starting from economic divides to digital divides to what have you, that this country together can prosper and be an example for nations that are less equipped in terms of talent, in terms of uh, several other things that it takes to make a successful story. But what is it that you should do? You should recognize that in an age of disruption, you're fighting a war. I know I'm a pacifist, but I think what I'm about to explain to you is best explained in terms of war. Those that win wars are the people that fight wars for the right reasons. You shouldn't pick every single issue and go to war. It's not worth it. The price you pay might be very high. The principles of war as several successful generals have demonstrated over the years, is that first you must know yourself, starting from the Bible to every other book. It tells us, know thyself is important. So your strengths, your weaknesses, most importantly your potential, you must know. Why is that important? Because between potential and performance for each one of us, whether we are individuals or institutions, there is a huge gap between where we are and where we ought to be. And the journey of excellence is the journey from present performance levels to the achievement of our potential. That is something that industry should set the pace for, industry should set the example for, so that we can maximize whatever potential resides in us. It's also important to know the enemy. It's not enough to know yourself to fight the war. And if you have to know the enemy, you must know the enemy's strength and weaknesses, and I am not talking about an enemy as an enemy in war, but the circumstances that are arrayed against you, the obstacles, the pitfalls that you need to circumvent in order to get to where you intend to get. The journey can be exciting, but it doesn't mean that in the excitement you lose the journey itself and never reach the destination. And then draw the battle lines yourself. Today that is important for industry. You need to know which issues to fight. Sometimes I believe that industry and with respect to industry organizations lose their way because they are too many things of governments at the same time without prioritizing 
what they need to ask. And I think prioritize the sequence in your demands. These are extremely important. We must also remember when we started out, it took Gandhiji to tell us that businessmen are trustees. And why did he say that? There are several interpretations of that. When Gandhiji said businessmen are trustees, was he telling businessmen, was he reminding businessmen that you needed to be seen as repositories of trust? That the leadership position that the economy has created for you, which you have occupied legitimately, is based on trust and should be based on trust. Today, all our laws, our rules, our regulations are premised on distrust. They are premised on the belief, which I think is mistaken, that if you don't have laws and regulations, humankind will necessarily misconduct itself. That's not true. The number of people who don't need laws and rules, and I'm sure many are present in this room, to tell you what is right and what is wrong and why you should do what is right, not do what is wrong. But there are also several whose good conduct is conditioned by what the British judge Most of us have passed through agents. So those in whose name the regulations are written are the ones that pick up the tab. And often the benefit that is conferred on them or sought to be conferred on them is less than the cost they pay, the price they pay for that. So you need to have some kind of realism in the regulatory processes. More importantly, and this is a matter of trust, you need even-handed regulation. Earlier it used to be said, show me the man and I'll show you the rule. There has been a slight change. Over the years we have moved from there to show me the man and I will tell you whether the rule ought to be applied. The rule exists. It's not different rules, the rule is there. But whether it will apply or not will be based on who that man is, in whose context you are asking yourself the question, do I need to apply this rule? We need to get to more objectivity, more transparency, more even handedness. And for all of this, I think organizations like the CII need to set the pace. You are a large organization, you are a responsible organization. You are an organization which has a track record of performance over decades. There was a time when I used to joke to my friends whenever I saw Mr. Tarun Das sitting with Monte Carlo earlier and secretaries to the government waiting outside to meet Monte. Whereas he was spending long time with Tarun Das, I mentioned to them, you guys haven't got it. This is called seeing eye to eye with CII. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 is, that was the philosophy. So taking advantage of that old position, you need, I think, to drive change, drive the kind of agenda that you think ought to be driven. A couple of last thoughts before I sign off. One, the distrust of the businessmen is based on the fact, and I'm being absolutely blunt, the advantage of being a little old is you can be blunt also. You won't be mistaken. At best, people will say, God knows what he's talking about. But the distrust of the businessmen is based on the fact that the average businessman makes more money than the average non-businessman, for want of a better word, let me put it that way. And therefore money is sought to be portrayed as this great evil that you have come to embrace, whereas others are unable to embrace them. The scriptures across religions tell us in different words that money is not the root of all evil. It is love of money which is the root of all evil. So long as and there was reference to CSR, so long as money stays the right place, in your banks, in your wallets it's safe, when it gets into bloodstream and your thought processes, there is a little problem there. So I think in your privilege you need to share with society, not as handouts, but as creating opportunities for the less privileged to rise a little higher. Handouts are not what should be encouraged, no matter who is giving out handouts and in what context. More importantly, who is offering handouts which might never be given out. Uh, that is something we don't know, the future will tell how much of this will be given out. And I'm not making a political statement, I take great pride, I take great pride in the fact that over a service career of 
40 years they have not been politically aligned to any party or any politician. In the state government where I served, not here but in the distant northeast, I was always the favorite of whichever party was in the opposition. So. <laughs> and therefore, while I've worn several hats in windy conditions, some hats have tended to be blown off, I've had to hold on to them, but uh, uh, they remained till the end of the course. So, the point I'm making is this. Create the atmosphere, the opportunity, the participative circumstances in which the less privileged can measure up to what they can do but for want of opportunities. You create the opportunities for them. We live in disruptive times, but disruption, as I told you, is no longer a bad word. You have a choice. You can either respond to disruption or you can be the disruptors. I would rather that so long as it doesn't go against the grain of what you think is right, each of you must be disruptors. Because if sensible men and women disrupt, what will happen is that that disruption will be good for humankind. If not so sensible men and women disrupt, the results would be disastrous. So I think you should be the script writers of your destiny. Often what happens is that somebody else disrupts and you're playing black pieces. You're responding, you're reacting, you're not making the first move. Because I know recently uh, two grandmasters got together and played a game where black playing the first pieces. But most of chess and in what we see in life, it's white that plays the first, makes the first move. I think responding and reacting and uh, crying about disruption is not going to get us anywhere. It's recognizing the opportunity that resides there, grabbing that opportunity. And on the subject of regulation, let me say this and close, that you have to mount a national movement for two things. One, not creating any more institutions. This country is a plethora of institutions. This business of give me a problem and I give you an institution must stop. <laughs> Earlier it used to be give me a problem and I give you a solution. Don't create institutions. Two, before a new law is made or a new regulation is written, there must be a bunch of sensible people, including some of you, who look at existing laws and say, what is wrong with what we have now? Isn't better enforcement the answer? If you shrink that space, we will get to where we ought to get, to where India legitimately belongs. Thank you very much. The perspective of an engineer coming with a, talking about money and talking about how we should be looking at it. So can I have a question to do a special like this?
and our father's ambition and his hard work ensured that me and my brother could avail the benefits of higher education. So I remain extremely grateful to him. And in that sense, this personal connection is something that I really value. So I'm very privileged to be amongst you. <laughs> Given the theme for disruption, what I'm going to talk about is talk about what we've done over the last few years and then try and set the agenda for what we need to do and in that especially build on some very, very valuable thoughts that uh, speakers before me have, have touched upon. So let me first start by describing where we are and what we've done over the last five years. Even though I'm going to be talking about money, I will reiterate what Damodaran sir very rightly said that money should only be in the bank accounts, not in our blood, not in our mind. In fact, if you think about it, that is the way to make money, to let it not be in the, in the minds. But given that this is about money, so over the last five years, I think there are a few things that are really salient about the Indian economy. The Indian economy has grown at a very high rate of growth, historically high. And despite any controversy that, that you know, you must have in the newspapers about the GDP numbers, etc., let me, in my official capacity, also uh, uh, validate that given the three months that I've spent, one of the things that I've realized is that the number of touch points of policy in India are several. And therefore, it is very hard to actually create a narrative that is we may have our dispute about the way in which the proxies have been created and that itself has actually uh, aspects relating to some of the changes like demonetization and CSP that have happened. But the fact remains that we have recorded very high levels of growth. In fact, the average rate of growth is the highest for any government since liberalization. And that is something that is extremely important for us to, to make a note of. This growth has been achieved on some conditions which actually provides resilience for us. Because this growth has been achieved amidst economic conditions in the world where, first of all, the headwinds against globalization have actually dampened our exports. Secondly, and some, some as, an aspect that I'm going to touch upon in a lot more detail later in my, in, in my uh, my, my thoughts here. In 2015 and continuing later, the credit culture, the credit growth itself was actually in quite a bad shape. So the 7.5% average growth that we've recorded over the last five years has happened despite credit growth being very, very slow and becoming almost grinding to a halt. Uh, and especially for the small and medium firms, which is that, that usually happens when, when, when banks become, you know, when banks start accumulating bad assets, they become risk averse and therefore, uh, you know, sort of uh, start depriving credit to the, those borrowers who do not have as much of credit history. So despite the fact that there have been headwinds against globalization and the fact that credit growth has been quite tepid during this period, yet we have achieved an average growth of 7.5%. And that has been primarily because the growth has been furthered by consumption in the domestic economy, which itself is important because given the fears about recession that, you know, that uh, people and all economists are anticipating globally, the fact that our growth has happened based on domestic consumption puts resilience and therefore makes us more immune to, to, you know, to sort of some of the shocks that we may experience globally and that I think is a good aspect that we must definitely keep in mind. This Growth from, from consumption itself has been because of one other key aspect that we've, uh, you know, that, that something that we should make a note of, which is inflation. So, in about in 2014 15, the rates of inflation were in excess of 10%, double digit inflation. And as economists and most of, our, like most of us agree, inflation is a pernicious tax on the poor. And when the rates of inflation were 10%, what also happens is that inflation feeds 
on inflation expectations itself. And inflation expectations are quite critical. So here's where the change that we've had over the last five years, the average rates of inflation have been about 4.5%. That's a significant change compared to the 10% plus rates of inflation that, that prevailed. And to just translate that into something that we all uh, witness in our day-to-day -day lives, if suppose those 10% rates of inflation had prevailed during these last five years, then today many of the essential commodities would have been at least 30-35% costlier compared to what they actually are. And that is what, and that matters very much for people who possibly are outside this room, the people who actually are, are you know, poorer, who are in the middle class, for them this is something which is a significant benefit. Now tie this in with what I actually mentioned about economic growth coming from domestic consumption. Domestic consumption itself has been encouraged by the fact that purchasing power, you know, in the domestic economy has increased because inflation has been low. That's the second aspect which is, um, and this itself, the change in inflation, part of it at least can, at least can be attributed to the structural change which is the uh, making our central bank through the monetary policy framework, making the central bank an inflation target up and ensuring that the rate of inflation is 4% is plus minus 2% to within the band of 2% to 6%. You know, as we continue to have the debate about, you know, inflation targeting, etc., but to, in, in my mind at least, you know, the monetary policy framework has been an important contributor to the lowering of inflation. A third aspect that is that is quite important in the context of um, you know what has been achieved is some path-breaking reforms. And I think we've all been reading about some of the difficulties in GST. Based on my research, you know, across several countries, what I've observed is that no path-breaking change, you know achieves perfection immediately. It takes time for it to actually tweak around, tweak around and only then, you know, and in a country as large in, as India, as diverse as India, it's even more um, important for us to be tolerant about the fact that we will not be able to hit, you know, perfection with policy changes immediately. But let's be, let, let's, let's recognize that GST is an important change because at least creates the conditions for India as, as one market and not, not 30 odd markets. A second important structural reform, and which is something that I'm going to talk about in more detail, is the bankruptcy court, which is clearly important. Because before, before the bankruptcy court, that before the bankruptcy court was passed, and I'm actually, even though I'm um, younger uh, than, you know, than, than uh, Damodar and Sir, I'm going to be actually taking the liberty as well of being blunt. And saying that before the bankruptcy court, a lot of the businesses played the game of I, I toss a coin, I win if it is heads, and you the bank loses if it is tails. That's the game that was played. And that game has created significant costs for the economy because if you think about the cost of capital that a borrower pays, that cost of capital is comprised definitely by, you know, by the risk-free rate, the rate that the government pays, but a much more important component is what is called the credit spread. So on the risk-free rate, the credit spread that you add, that credit spread is a significant determinant of the cost of capital. And here's where the bankruptcy court becomes critical in trying to understand why the cost of capital has been very high and why with some behavioral changes, why the cost of capital can possibly go down drastically and thereby, thereby be a disruptor. So if you dig a little bit deeper, the cost of, the, the, the cost of capital itself, it is composed of the credit spread. The credit spread itself is driven by two things, which is the anticipated probability of default, which is the anticipation at the time when the bank is giving the loan, what is the anticipation that the bank has that this borrower will be able to repay or not? Because on none of our faces is it written that this borrower will definitely repay and this borrower will not. So the bank has to anticipate and, and, and decide what is the expected probability of default. That's one key determinant. And here's where if you have even a few bad fish in the pond, what quite likely happens is that all the fish in the pond are thought to be 
to be to be bad because when the bank draws randomly and finds out one fish is bad, it makes the bank think that maybe all the other fishes in the pond are also bad, and thereby the expected probability of default that the bank puts on any borrower, especially those without a credit record like the small and you know and, and medium firms, for them the, the, the probability of default anticipated becomes quite high. That's number one. Number two is the, the, the loss given default, which is essentially saying that if I lend a hundred rupees and the borrower has defaulted on that loan, how much as a bank am I going am I able to retrieve you know, from that loan? And here's where some of the aspects become critical. If suppose the judicial process elongates after being, you know, after a, a, a borrower defaults process continues for a long time and the borrower can use various shenanigans to actually tunnel out assets, what is left for the bank is very, very small of the order of 10 to 15 rupees for every 100 rupees. This also adds significantly to the, to the, to the credit spread and thereby the cost of cost of reform. And here's where the bankruptcy code, I think, is an extremely important reform because as we talk and in my discussions with banks, what has already started happening is that borrow and capital. I think land and labor, we all know what has to be done. On capital, and that's where I'm going to be you know, focusing my, my, the rest of my remarks on, is especially in the, talking about the bankruptcy court. Mr. So Damodaran you know, touched about, I think, an excellent aspect, which is that tell me the rule, and then I look at the man and decide whether to um, apply the rule or not. This is one aspect that has really been infesting the bankruptcy process in this country. And that's where I think the bankruptcy, the, the way the bankruptcy court gets applied, and more importantly, the culture that, that, that we have, the culture that we want to create becomes extremely important. By not only ensuring that smaller and larger or small borrowers are brought into bankruptcy, also some of the, the top 12 defaulters, what are called the dirty dozen, bringing them together to bankruptcy, I think in this country we've taken a step that is unprecedented by ensuring that rather than looking at who is that man on whom the rule is being applied, the bankruptcy rule, ensuring that the rule is being applied equally well, but there is still some progress that we have to make here. And here's where I want to touch, touch on, even though as an economist I do believe strongly in incentives, in strategy, etc. But there is a, 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 a saying that culture eats incentives and strategy for breakfast. And in that context, in the context of the culture that actually has prevailed, I'm going to draw on some of our, some of the, the, the spiritual threads that really connect all of us as Indians. I'm going to draw on that to speak about the culture of credit that has prevailed and that should be prevailing so that the real benefits of, of bankruptcy court and credit really accrue to all borrowers. So I'm going to actually quote from, for instance, the Hindu law had a doctrine called the pious obligation doctrine, the doctrine of pious obligation, and I'm going to quote from that, which says that it regards non-payment of debt as a positive sin. Now remember, I'm actually not talking about economic aspects, I'm talking about moral aspects which affect the culture. And therefore, let me quote, the doctrine of pious obligation regards non-payment of debt as a positive sin, the evil consequences of which follow the undischarged debtor even in the afterward. And this is something that all of us Indians can definitely relate to. It is for the purpose of rescuing the father from his torments in the next world that an obligation is placed on the son to repay their father's debt. That is the culture that our spiritual threads have actually inherited us. This obligation the pious doctrine of pious obligation. And this is not just with the Hindu law. Let me also point out that there is a practice in other religions as well. When a man passes away, they actually bring out bring out actually a, a you know a container containing notes. They spread it around 
saying that if somebody, if, if, if that person did not repay the debts, then please do take them now so that the person's last journey can be had without any debts. And that is the culture that this country has, has actually respected and really uh, inherited. Because I am among luminaries here in the CII, I'm going to draw upon again something that we all know about the Bhagavad Gita. In chapter 3, Shloka 21, that Shloka goes as Yat Yat Acharati Sreshtataha Tatta Teve Durojanaha Sayat Pramanam Kurute Lokas Tat Anuartate Yat Yat Acharati how acharan means action. Yet, yet acharati sreshtataha. The way in which people like you, luminaries here, the way you behave, sreshth, the way you behave, tat tat teve taro janaha. People outside this room, they look at your actions as actually the benchmark and follow that. Sayat pramanam kurute, praman proof. The proof of actions that you give. Sayat Ramanam Kurute, Lokas Tat Anuvartate. That's what they take as proof and then for take as benchmark and follow it. And therefore, it is really beholden on all the people here, the luminaries of the business world in India, to actually follow this edict from none other than the Supreme Lord, in the saying in the Bhagavad Gita, to set your actions in such a way that you actually follow at least the doctrine of pious obligation. Look at the moral aspect so that the culture that we'll create, the credit culture that we'll create here will not require as much of incentive. No, the, the role of the government definitely is to, no question, create incentives and you know, we will definitely be, be doing that. But remember that culture creates incentives and strategy for credit. Therefore, it is extremely important to respect the moral dimensions of the debt contract. The debt contract in its essence has the following feature, which is that the equity holder, the promoter or the businessman, when things go well, the promoter or the businessman keeps all the goods, all the, all the benefits by repaying the obligations. But if things go bad, it is beholden on that and its contractual obligation ensure that control and, you know, is passed on and ensure that you still, still do not hold on to it and you know, sort of do all kinds of shenanigans to try and retain control. That is the essence of the equity contract. And we cannot, so far we've had a situation where because of the way in which the bankruptcy process has, has, has worked, it's been a case of private profits and socialized losses. Losses getting socialized through banks because eventually what appears in the deposits and the equity of the of, of the banks is either taxpayer money or depositor money. So this important change in culture is something that is absolutely paramount if India has to be a disruptor and move on and become occupy its place in the comedy of nations. With those thoughts, let me actually end my, my thoughts here with, with a sanguine prayer. This prayer appears in the Vishnu Sahasranam Stotram and is also from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, shloka 78. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Partho Dharutara Tatra Shri Vidyo Bhuti Dhuvan Dhimakirma Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yogeshwara, the epitome of wisdom, Shri Krishna. When you have wisdom, Yatra Partho Dharutara part, Arjuna, where you have focused action, focus on creating good, business as actually a venture of creating good, where there is wisdom and where there is focus in creating good, there, there will be Sri, which is fortune, Vijay, victory, Bhuti, which is prosperity, Dhruvaha, infallibility, Niti, morality. That's the part that actually emphasizes the point. So with that sanguine prayer to the, the Supreme Lord, I would urge you all to actually think about some of my words and try to, to sort of act upon it. Thank you very much for your patience. Whatever influences happen in the global arena has an impact on us also. 
as was mentioned by Dr. Subramaniam, our country is a very complex and a very large country where the different levels of demand from the different quality and their requirements are various. In this uh, scenario, I think what we have learned from both our eminent speakers, very powerful speakers, have left a lot of thoughts uh, for us to ponder on and I am sure that we have extremely interesting times ahead and with these discussions we will also make the right decisions in the future. As was mentioned that over the years uh, CII has truly earned its place as one of the uh, forums the forums uh, for industry in India. It's a credible, it's a very credible uh, platform, and uh, at the right time, we too have really embraced the thought of being an inclusive, not only in part of, in terms of industry, but also in terms of inclusivity. And I'm sure this would also be a very responsible way for every one of us in this. Uh, uh, audience and industry to look at our country in the future. With these few words, I thank uh, both the speakers for the very, very powerful uh, speech today and uh, all of you to have been present here today. I would request the delegates to remain seated for the next session. Thank you. The next session is immediately starting. I think it's happened since time immemorial. But technology changes the kinds of things we do, work opportunities as well. New work opportunities, whether in traditional uh, IT related fields or even in non IT fields where some digital literacy or the ability to use a machine uh, is, is, is essential. And lots of new sort of value chains and new worker opportunities could get created. We think that number is about 60 to 65 billion. So on net, there will be more opportunities, but a lot of labor market disruption as well. Uh, and so in conclusion, this is, I think, one of the biggest opportunities this country faces for growth, for inclusive growth, but also for disruptions and transitions which need to be managed. And each stakeholder, whether it's business, government, or each of us as actually responsible users of technology, have a role to play in preparing and ready for this. Uh, so, so that's a quick overview of how we see the opportunity and how exciting it is. Uh, I'm now going to actually turn to my co-panelists uh, and request each of them to come up and uh, share with us you know, uh, insights on their own journeys and also how they see the opportunity as well as how we should all get up for it. So I'd like to start with Mr. Anand Krishnan, the CTO of TCS, uh, who has a wealth of experience in this area. Thank you, Anu, and uh, uh, my personal thanks to uh, Dinesh and from a TCS perspective. Uh, this is a little bit of uh, the why of uh, the digital disruption. And lastly, I will, I will conclude with two things that we in TCS and I personally am using as tools. Uh, to help us through this transformation. First of all, um, the digital technologies that we are seeing today, and uh, uh, certainly ICT technologies are, are part of the story, uh, but over the last uh, two decades, what we have learned is that this is not an isolated opportunity. Um, the representation that you see here is the good old periodic table from, from chemistry, which uh, many of us may remember from school, uh, there are coincidentally about 105 or things that I and my team track on, on, a, on a daily basis, which might impact us. So I'm not going to walk you through all 105. But there are a few points that I'd like to highlight on how we are approaching this, this whole uh, disruption story. First is that you notice that all these boxes are colored. And there is a color code that you is there on the top right, but essentially the warmer colors, the reds and the oranges, are the ones which are driven by consumer adoption. 
So point number one is don't look at technologies just by saying I am an industry A, B, or C, but look at the technologies which are being adopted by larger and larger number of people. The ones in orange are the ones which we project will be adopted by billions of people worldwide. And those are the technologies that you automatically have to pay more attention to. Uh, one of the, the statistics that uh, Anu uh, put up was that the number of people uh, using broadband connections or smartphones is already up above 300, 400 million uh, people. Uh, I'm told that that number is actually more than the number of people in India who, hold a, who regularly use a toothbrush. You know, 800 million to 900 million toothbrushes are sold annually in India. Uh, assuming that we all change our toothbrush at least twice or thrice a year, of the order of magnitude, a toothbrush is seen to be less important than a smart device or an internet connection. And, and the toothbrushes are losing the race. They are not growing at 25% a year. Okay, so that's the first so Look at consumer adoption of any technology which is, which is on that upswing of consumer adoption will impact your industry. That's point number one. Point number two, come to the bottom where you, from tennis field, remember that's where the rare earth minerals, materials are. Those are the social counterpoints to technology growth. Not, not all technologists even acknowledge that social forces are important in technology. We have learned that there is a huge impact and I think on the last slide of the McKinsey study you said as a personal responsibility be a good steward of your own personal data. That's an example of a social counterbalance to unbridled use of technology, especially data-driven technology. And there are many more. Universal basic income is there, circular economy is there, sustainability is there. These would be counterbalancing forces to any digital technology. Third message is that each of those uh, uh, groups, as you can remember, verticals, are a mix of technologies, and industries, they group them in, in verticals so that they're related ones. And I'll talk about a few in a minute. The propensity of a technology to combine with other technologies or with industry trends, the so-called balancing of that particular technology is a very important factor. Technologies which show a propensity to work across industries, work with other technologies to amplify their effects, will be the ones that automatically bump up in your priority list. So these are the three takeaways: consumer adoption, social trends, and balancing that we use as methods to track which ones should we pay attention to. We don't have bandwidth to track all 100. Certainly we will not do them with the same intensity, but to prioritize. Second, what does this mean to the world of business? Just today, uh, uh, TCS launched this study, which uh, is out there now on our website, um, we call this opportunity as business 4.0. Just like every wave of preceding technologies in the past resulted in a significant change in the way in which we do business. Technology 1.0 or industry 1.0, the power of steam, gave rise to mass production as a significant competitive advantage to industries. People who could mass produce became the Fortune 500 companies of the 1800s. The era of, of railroads, communications, telegraph, telephone, gave rise to the template of the modern corporation who could produce things at scale in one part of the world and use efficient communication transportation to distribute them, sell them in different parts of the world. And that era started in about the 1870s and dominated the world till the 1950s. The third technological revolution, the first wave of computing, enterprise computing, gave rise to the services business. And suddenly banks, insurances, technology companies themselves, telecoms companies, service companies of any kind, retail and so on, they became nationally and sometimes globally significant because they were leveraging the power of information. We believe that this digital story that is around us right now is going to give rise to a new way of doing business, which is what we believe is business 4.0. What does business 4.0 mean? First, it has a dimension which we call the ability to mass personalize experience. 
Mass personalization of experience is something which we already see the so-called digital champions do. Uh, the, the online industries, the, the retailers, the technical companies, the social media companies, and so on. It means that you are able to find out what your stakeholder, your customer needs every instant of every day and you're able to provide that experience-based product or service as that customer's needs change. This is very different from what we're used to in Business 3.0. Many of us fly airlines and so on and so forth uh, and the best that an airline or, or any other loyalty program driven industry can do is to give you a badge or a card which is gold, silver, black, grey, whatever, and hopefully treat you differently every time you have a touch point with that industry. That is 3.0. 4.0 is that every real-time interaction with your product. And here I've given the example of a car. A car is now a, a connected vehicle which is trying to personalize to every interaction, every minute for its driver, its passengers, and indeed the car interacting with the ecosystem itself. And this is again going back to my earlier point of intersection of technologies. This is not just being done by the automotive industry. The tech industry is involved, the insurance industry is involved, the health industry is involved, the smart city people are involved, and all kinds of communications technologies, sensor technologies, engineering, manufacturing, all are changing because the car is now a personal connected experience. Example number two of business 4.0 companies, they are not satisfied with one layer of value creation. The traditional value creation in business 1, 2 and 3 was that I have a need, it's fulfilled by somebody else and I, I transact with that person, value exchange his hands. Business 2.0 onwards, the notion of exponential value started emerging, but 4.0 companies are now masters at exponential value. A unit transaction gives rise to data about the transaction. The data about the transaction becomes another transaction, and so on and so forth. To the extent that now, conventional organizations, this is uh, an example of a, of a power plant, which is now thinking about itself as part of a data ecosystem by creating the digital twin of their equipment, like in this case a boiler, and not just deriving benefit for themselves in terms of efficiency and, and ability to service it better and so on. We have done this in Japan, they're doing this in the US and so on with, with very cool AI and modeling technology. But the point is that the business model that this is now creating for the energy utility is that I can now be real time. I can now buy and sell data about power consumption. I can now have business models built on the fact that my equipment is intelligent. And this is a great example of a combination of technologies on the generation side, the distribution side, the consumption side, and new business models emerging. Many countries are now deregulating the entire power value chain on the basis of capabilities like this. The UK, the Australians, the, in some parts of, of Europe and so on, this is the direction in which everybody is, is heading. Business 4.0 companies are very good at embracing risk. Risk is now part of the business model rather than something to be defined and avoided. I know many, many CEOs in this room would have their risk and audit committees saying that you know, this is utter nonsense, but if you look at the way in which a startup company functions, they have a very nice term called a pivot. A pivot is a gotcha moment which says, I have no idea what happened, but hey, I'm going to change course and do something else totally different. Can you think of your company even using the word pivot in a board meeting? That is what business 4.0 companies are learning to do, to handle risk in new technologies and business models with that fast, iterative, fail fast kind of a story. And this is across those technology opportunities, but it's a mindset change that these companies are, are using using technology but to change the way they're doing uh, business, especially in the speed at which they're able to respond. Lastly, business 4.0 companies are very good at creating ecosystems. They don't work alone. A supply chain is a linear, fixed, static ecosystem. And business 3.0 companies perfected it. Business 4.0 companies have dynamic ecosystems and they are not limited to just the business ecosystem. 
this is an example of something that we ourselves in TCS are doing, which is to create an ecosystem around smart cities, but not as a straight line as you would imagine, but this is a, a, a center that's been established in Nasik, works with the city administration, the district of Nasik, entrepreneurial talent that are funded by our charity foundation, and an incubator which is turning out social entrepreneurs who are tackling the problems of the state and of the, the, the district and city of Nasik through social entrepreneurship and, by the way, driving value to the startups and perhaps to the ecosystem, including TCS itself. So this is a very different way of thinking about ecosystems in today's world and it's enabled by technology but the mindset and the business model are very different. Ecosystems are a theme that I wanted to re-emphasize. This is the way I look at my job. In the past, I would have put the TCS research and innovation, the red dot, in the middle of the universe and say every other planet revolves around me. Today, my customer, and by translation, my customer's customer is the center of the universe. I'm watching what my customer is doing and what, how they're responding to their customer. I assemble an ecosystem of everything from academia on the bottom left to the social and entrepreneurial networks on the, on the top to the industry networks on the right and build models where the opportunity is tackled by who is best placed to handle that opportunity at speed. For example, we work with over 3,000 startups worldwide, <coughs> many from India, many from Silicon Valley, many from Israel, many from Europe, many from other parts of the world. They are my front line of defense to say whatever it is that TCS research and innovation cannot do as a new product or service, is there a startup somewhere in the world which is even close? Let's go with them. And then we put them in our agile model and go forward with them. Academic institutions give us the long term view of what are the trends that I should worry about from a 2025 2030 perspective. We have nearly a thousand people in TCS research, which is great. But universities worldwide are full of smart people who don't work for TCS. So why should I not tap into those networks? And so on. So this ecosystem mindset is something which is very central to the way I think about TCS and its future. I'd like to conclude with this tool which came out of uh, a lot of work by Professor David Christensen of Harvard Business School. All the ideas that I've talked about, digital technologies, disruptions, experience-based models, ecosystem-based models, exponential models, embracing risk, and so on. Clearly, there are hundreds of things that you can end up doing. Clay was on our board uh, as an independent director for, for many years. He just stepped down a few months ago. And he actually drew this in my office in Bombay about 18 years ago and said, this is what he would suggest as an approach for someone like me to plan how should I allocate my resources? It's based on Clay's jobs to be done framework. The horizontal line is essentially that. Observe your customers today, but try to anticipate what jobs your customers will have tomorrow. They will not need not necessarily do those jobs with you. So there are jobs and needs that your customers have. What are the capabilities that you have today, bottom of the chart, and what are the capabilities that you need for tomorrow? Those four quadrants, very deeply, management professors like two by twos. Uh, there's a joke in uh, management school circles that uh, is often told that the reason why two by twos are so popular with management professors is that if they know how to count beyond two, they become engineers. <laughs> so two by two is, is all that a, a management professor can handle. But this gives you a way to prioritize those four quadrants and say, how much money am I going to spend on the bottom right, today's business? and on the others, what ROI do I expect, who's going to do it, and operate those simultaneously as you build uh, a business 4.0 organization. Thank you very much. Industries in the domain which was largely controlled over the world by state actors, and many interesting things are happening in this uh, field. And, uh, especially since uh, space is uh, going through a transformation of phase uh, driven by disruptive technologies, search and demand and ever lowering costs. In India, space business was uh, traditionally looked upon as a demanding, low volume, risky business 
with uh, no returns. And that was a deterrent for many industries to look at the space, uh, even though it, was, it played a very important role in digital communication. But today, many things have changed. And uh, new technologies have enabled smaller, cheaper, and more efficient uh, satellites. Some of the technologies uh, I would like to mention is the way these uh, space platforms are, where, are configured to deliver uh, services, uh, space-based services to the Earth. One was uh, earlier, or today, even today, space-based services were being delivered or are being delivered by weak satellites, maybe uh, communication satellites are as big as uh, school buses, weighing uh, four tons, six tons, and uh, taking years to build, costing hundreds of millions of dollars, and costing another 100, 120 million dollars to launch, and of course giving a very uh, long life also, maybe 15, 20 years it used to serve. And out of this uh, six ton satellite, 60 percent of the weight is the weight of propellants uh, for it to last in the uh, orbit and to maintain its orbit during that period. So the developments in microelectronics with FPGAs, 20 nanometer technology in foundries, miniaturization has driven uh, the development of uh, space hardware uh, into small, small units which are much more powerful with new IT technologies also getting in. And you are able to deliver those kind of services in much smaller packages with, together with other technologies like electric propulsion technology. The 60% of the weight, as I said earlier, was chemical propellants carried by a satellite today that is not required because electric propulsion has come. So satellite weight has reduced by nearly 50%. So all this has combined together to make the satellite much lighter. And this urgent demand has enabled uh, configuration of large number of satellites. So this has brought in economies of scale. And we can see automation technologies getting into satellite building. And one of the first uh, companies to adopt this is uh, OneWeb. You may be aware of that uh, company. And together with uh, Airbus, Airbus has designed this uh, automated factory. I had the opportunity to visit it in Toulouse. That uh, is capable of making one satellite per shift, whereas uh, the norm here today is about uh, one to at least two years to build uh, that kind of a satellite. And corresponding reduction in cost as well. The cost has come down by an order for those kind of satellites. So the way the platforms are built is today, instead of that one big satellite or three big satellites uh, which uh, provides digital communication throughout the world, it is being replaced by a constellation of uh, small satellites, thousands of small satellites which will be circling the Earth and that were at a very low orbit so that uh, the problem of latency is also solved. Lat latency in voice delivery, latency in data delivery is also solved. And uh, these sat satellites have uh, miniaturized technologies, very powerful, and using electric propulsion, and weighing only about 150, 200 kilograms. So your launch costs are also less. The satellite life properly only about uh, three to five years, but that enables the company to replace the satellites when the technology uh, is uh, changing in this uh, field uh, when the technology changes it is very important to adopt the technology. So a whole new business model is uh, evolving and uh, OneWeb has already launched six of its satellites uh, last month and we can soon see this particular technology of uh, small satellite constellations replacing the large big satellites of uh, the previous era happening right before our eyes in the next few years itself. And you can see many more companies like uh, SpaceX for example have uh, already got FCC approval for a constellation of more than 4,000 satellites. Similarly Boeing, Telesat, Telesat's uh, 
a proof of concept model that was launched by us uh, last year and uh, many other companies. Uh, so total number of uh, satellites uh, in the next uh, 10 years was expected around uh, 25,000 or even more. So this uh, brings a lot of opportunities uh, for making satellite subsystems and also you know, uh, delivering these kind of services to the masses by partnering with these kind of players. Global space industry is valued at around uh, $350 billion and uh, Morgan Stanley has uh, predicted this to touch 1.9 trillion by 2014 and similar prediction was also done by Goldman Sachs. And this is a huge growth uh, that is coming to space and uh, we see that we will be seeing double digit uh, CAGR in the space industry it is about 2 to 3 percent growth only today because of the transformational phase in technology and the uncertainty related with it but it is definitely touch uh, two digit uh, growth in the near future so that is a lot of opportunity and uh, you can see the when it is being delivered to the masses the antenna systems that there also the network systems etc uh, there is a lot of uh, technology innovation uh, that has happened and flat panel antennas, very powerful antennas, very small antennas, affordable antennas are coming. And I don't know in future probably these antennas will become small enough to get into the smartphones itself. So then the whole game will change. In India, uh, the space commerce has been largely driven by, driven by ISRO. Though many industries are involved in the space program, their involvement has been of uh, subcontractor type only. There was, there are no two space companies in the private sector which is a big worry because we feel that uh, private sector is best positioned to take care of the commercial needs of the country. And this is another, the technology disruptions that are happening uh, is probably uh, an indicator for the private industry to take note and uh, because of the lowering costs in uh, space systems, in uh, using the uh, launch services, etc. Uh, this is becoming affordable and the scenario of uh, a successful space industry in India is also very good. India offers significant demand for satellite based services as you are already aware. The demand for broadband connectivity uh, is increasing rapidly as uh, given by a news presentation also. And there is also uh, another opportunity in IoT based services and India is ideally uh, positioned to utilize the services of IoT in the agriculture sector and many other connected cars you take uh, uh, machine to machine in IoT. In India there is a big market uh, for those kind of services. So that is another opportunity uh, that uh, people may like to look at. And uh, then another vertical important vertical other than communication is remote sensing. Uh, there also, there are a lot of uh, changes that are happening. The same concept of uh, the service delivery through a constellation of small satellites uh, is already there in, uh, in, in remote sensing. You might remember the 104 satellite record that was uh, done by us, world record launch. In that, about 88 uh, satellites were of a small uh, startup called uh, uh, planet Labs in the US and they operate a constellation of satellite like for 150 satellites. Each satellite is only 5 kg, you know, right? they are, the satellites are built around the camera. So it is, it is a very innovative idea and uh, uh, they have very powerful softwares to process the uh, data on the ground and then uh, deliver off the cloud to the consumers. Uh, so uh, that is again a revolution uh, that is happening in Sensing. Today, you know, the uh, consumer, main consumers uh, are government uh, in India, including defense, and uh, they require, you know, uh, images and video from space is another uh, services that are in great demand, especially for the defense services. And uh, this also is uh, something that probably will be in the orbit with the advancements in auto processing and uh, storage capacities in the satellites in the near future that also uh, you will see. And these are not out of reach of uh, small industries. And there we see a lot of uh, startups in space in India 
probably even five years back, uh, I could not have imagined that a startup can come in space and uh, set up shop. Uh, but today, uh, we have we are surprised and we are presently surprised to see that there are probably more than 50 startups in the, in the space provided in India. And uh, they are, uh, there are companies which design and make uh, launch vehicles, that is rockets. Uh, and there is a startup in Bangalore <laughs> which is uh, working on capturing this great uh, surge in demand for digital services delivered through satellites, the broadband services through satellites. They are designing and building again a satellite constellation. This will be the first company if they are successful to design uh, and uh, deliver these kind of services using constellation of uh, satellites over, uh, uh, over the world. So India <coughs> with uh, its space pedigree and uh, the uh, track record that we have for launching more than 300 uh, foreign satellites from Indian soil is ideally position for garnering this uh, large growth in, uh, in the space domain and play a large part in delivering this uh, digital services uh, and also the remote sensing uh, services to the Indian consumers. And uh, the, uh, the startup sector is an indicator. There is a booming presence of startups in, in, in space in India, and uh, that is also something uh, that adds uh, to the fact that uh, space is something that uh, is affordable for many industries to come into. So the seeds are being sown for India to become a big player in the commercial space. I just wanted to bring these facts to the colleagues in CII. Uh, for their understanding and uh, future business decisions. Thank you. About disruption in general, of course, in the, in the context of manufacturing. Talk a little bit about the, uh, the digital transformation that is occurring. What is to what can be, right? And then I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, something which is very unique to us, which is our own transformation as a manufacturer not as a technology company, but as a manufacturer, uh, you know, uh, as, as we've embraced some of these uh, ideas that have been spoken about. Uh, and uh, then I will wrap it up with uh, probably some, uh, some food for thought for you all, right, as a break into lunch. So, uh, Anand, I was taken in, I think great minds think alike, and uh, this was a graphic which, uh, which pretty much was, was uh, very consistent with what you had in your opening slide. Uh, you know, it comes to disruption. I think we are living in very interesting times, and I don't need to deliver that fact. It's been very, very actively put together by speakers before me, right? Uh, when it comes to manufacturing, I think what's going on right now is truly remarkable. You know, much of this is said about industry 4.2, etc. But essentially, if you really look at it, the transformation that we are witnessing, we're living through right now, right? Uh, which is enabled by technology, undoubtedly. Things like, you know, AI, things like uh, industrial IoT, uh, you know, uh, uh, augmented reality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What it is basically doing is creating possibilities that have, up until now, you know, not even been in the realm of imagination. And I would, I would use a couple of minutes to, to, to illustrate uh, that point further later on in my talk. I would say that in the context of manufacturing, probably the biggest disruption that has occurred and is occurring is the breakdown of the boundaries between what was the operation technologies of OD as it is commonly called and IT, you know, these technologies that we tend to broadly classify as, as cloud and uh, you know, big data analytics, etc., etc., right? You know, for decades, these two were independent worlds that were not really mixing up with each other at all. Uh, not in reality, not even in our imagination, right? But those boundaries are already broken, right? And enabled by you know these new technologies, what's coming out is a set of possibilities that is creating value which is uh, unprecedented, right? It is also breaking a lot of paradigms. So you know it is it's calling for all of us to first of all embrace that change. Uh, you know, unless you embrace the change, you will not be able to embrace the value that comes along with that change. That change requires leadership, and that change requires all of us basically, you know, given and not resist, right? And that would be also one point that I would like to talk to you about. So my bottom line key takeaway 
really is that industry really needs to embrace this idea that change propels the industry forward, right? And it really is those innovators, the early risk takers, you know, who embrace these new technologies. And they are taking risks, and we've heard about that, right? But they are also paving the pathway for others to tap into, uh, you know, uh, that that value that uh, you know we will be uh, discussing as we go further, right? So as I flash up this chart, I thought. Uh, this is, this is, in a way, a very busy chart, but what it talks about between the left-hand side and the right-hand side is a state that has been, those of you who are in any way, shape, or form connected with uh, manufacturing, factories, shop floors, plants, you know, might relate to it. While factories, for a long period of time, have been running in real time, based off of real-time data, talk about our water facilities, we're gonna talk about refineries, chemical plants, etc. The facilities themselves run on real-time data, but when it comes to the decision makers at a business level taking decisions, how do they get the information to take the, take the decisions off of, right? That, even today in a vast majority of businesses, actually happens in the form of, you know, reports that are either email, you know, dashboards that are created in Excel, right? You know, what it basically means is, by the time the data reaches the decision maker, it's already stable. So much for real time decision making. And this is the state right now. Right? What also happens is that there is a, there's a lot of manual touch. Right? There's a lot of manual touch. It's, uh, it's easy for biases to creep in because someone is manually preparing those reports. Right? And, you know, it, and that's the context in which a decision maker ends up making data, uh, decisions off of data which is already stale by the time it reaches. Sometimes it's stale by a shift, sometimes it's stale by a day, sometimes it's stale by a month, right? depending upon where you are in the picking order of the, picking order of the organization. Now, what we talked about, enabled by these technologies and the very disruptions that uh, has been spoken about, right, is to create end-to-end -end common uh, you know, uniform connect across the organization from shop floor to the enterprise and from really, the, you know, the, the set of data that is being looked at upon by an operator to a key decision maker like CEO, right? Real-time information, breakdown of all of these uh, boundaries, right? And having end-to-end -end transparency, right? So the, the, the set of data in a different context that is in the hands of the CEO or in the hands of a VP of operations, right? Versus what is there by a line, you know, line side operator in a different form, right? Essentially the same fact. That to me is one version of truth, and that is making decisions in real time. So I'm not talking technology over here, I'm talking about plain speed in business, right? And and this is the transformation that the technology that we've been talking about has the power to unleash. And it's been embraced already by many of you sitting here in the room to varying degrees, right? So, you know, I just want to lay it out here in front of us in the context of, uh, of, of, of manufacturing, the potential of, uh, uh, you know, uh, disruption and the value that it can unlock. Now, once you have this end-to-end -end transparency and common uh, set of data, and I will not talk about particular technologies that may be at use, either IoT or augmented reality or virtual reality or mixed reality. Let's just simplify that. Let's just talk about technology in general, the convergence of operation technologies and IT technologies. The value that it can unlock, first and foremost, is visibility. Visibility that is in the context of the persona. Persona could be that of an operator, persona could be that of a supervisor, persona could be that of a, a you know, CEO, right? You know, you get visibility into the process to the degree that is necessary for your role. And more important, you can self-serve as opposed to being constrained by someone who may have created a report format for you, right? It's unlocking unprecedented level of collaboration between people cutting across functions would be from maintenance to operations, would be from engineering and design, uh, could be from supply chain uh, to, uh, to, to you know, distribution, 
basically enabling an enterprise to work together to actually create competitiveness in the real world, in the market. Right? And of course, when you drive into end optimization, right, you're actually being able to you know, really unlock pull or value in terms of uh, you know, being a more nimble and more agile uh, operation or an enterprise that can react faster to external market stimuli. I can talk a whole lot about this graphic, a simple one that's there behind me. But I'll simplify it by saying that we see here is a, is a scenario which can be realized by this convergence that I just alluded to. Right? What it does is it's a it's a it's a site or it's a manufacturing plant, right, you know, which is equipped with these smart technologies. And what instantly happens in that scenario, in this paradigm? is that you have smart assets that make up the smart plant. Smart assets are basically self-aware and system-aware. What does it mean? What it means essentially is they are capable of broadcasting relevant information without really being told or asked for. To give you an example, energy utilization, energy state, or diagnostics, or a probable future failure mode that is likely to occur through advanced analytics, right? Now, this information in the hands of a human that is working in the plant, say in the shift, actually creates a lot of collaborative uh, you know, scenarios where you could easily, to take a simple example, divert some downtime, right? Uh, divert scenarios which may have led to poor quality, and plain and simple, being able to respond to real-time situations such as uh, lack of availability of a certain raw material in a very, very quick and an agile manner, right? So, essentially, if I just break it down into three simple parts, what you're doing is you're manufacturing faster, cheaper, and better, right? So you're becoming a much more competitive, uh, you know, enterprise. Now, some of you sitting in the room are familiar with us. Uh, you know, we come across as a technology provider to manufacturers. But a lesser known or appreciated fact is that we are a 115 year old company that's a global manufacturer itself. Right? We have plants that are distributed all across the globe. Uh, some of the plants are as old as 40, 50 years or older. Right? Uh, we have a product catalog that runs into almost 400,000 SKUs. Right? We support products because our, our focus is on the industry. So we have products which are uh, We've been on the catalog for over 20 years of these are electronic products, right? There's a lot of complexity in the supply chain, right? And all the same, we were recognizing that, uh, you know, the challenges which our customers were encountering were the very challenges that we ourselves were encountering, right? You know, on the supply side, there were increasingly a lot of challenges because we compete with the electronics industry, such as smartphone manufacturers, for our raw materials, right? And on the customer side, you know, our customer base is completely transforming because increasingly we are adding more and more new customers in emerging markets, right? So it became sort of obvious to us that we had to undertake this transformation within ourselves. And that started off almost an eight to 10 year long journey, right? Uh, and I would call it a journey because we haven't really reached a destination. But the milestones that we have crossed is that we have implemented this convergence between shop floor systems and enterprise systems, between IT and OT technologies, right? And we've been really doing a lot of benefits. We've got benefits which have really, you know, impacted our bottom line. And you can read some of these metrics, you know, that are there, uh, such as the inventory days coming down from about 120 to something like 80, right? It's drastically developed, drastically allowed us with an increasingly diverse new customer base, it's allowed us to actually cut down our lead times by almost 50%. And having end-to-end -end visibility across our enterprise, including the supply chain, actually has for many years now allowed us to improve our productivity by 4 to 5 percent. These are real hard metrics, right? And this is something which gives us a lot of confidence that we can and some of the scenarios that you've heard about this morning from, from people like Anand, 
have not even yet been fully implemented within our own manufacturing. Right? So we are, we are very excited and tickled about the possibilities that, uh, that lay in the future. But I just wanted to stand up over here and talk about this is real. This is real. This is, uh, this is already happening. And this is having the potential to literally transform businesses. But the question that I would like to throw up here today is while the upside would be something uh, you know, like this or even better, what's the cost of not taking that decision? The businesses that, that fail to recognize the truly disruptive impact of these technologies, right? And someone who's living in a, in, a, in a cocoon imagining that this is not likely to impact their business are really running a very high risk of uh, being literally disrupted out of their industry altogether. Right? So, uh, you know, I just wanted to leave you with a few thoughts. And this is really coming out of the, uh, the transformation that has occurred inside of our own business over the last close to a decade. Right? And I'll let you all lead through it. But a couple of things. It's true that the uh, the disruption itself is led by you know new technologies and convergence. But it is really not about technology. It's really not about the new shining object that you may have you know in a production environment or a line site. But it is much more about uh, uh, change management. It's much more about leadership. It's much more about being open to embrace the disruption. I was quite taken in by the theme of the, the, the summit this time, and I thought that it might be, uh, might be useful for you all to sort of uh, take a look at some of these uh, benefits that we pass as a group. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, and, and therefore, in this context, does it really come down to saying, you know, leadership matters, as you said, right? And how do you make that switch go on in the minds of a business leader? say that this is what I need to get done. And how do you then, does, does, does that whole cultural change have to start from the top for it to be really effective? Um, and and, and how, how do you really, what would be your counsel to a CEO or a business leader in that context? Maybe I think we can start with our reflections on that. Certainly, I think the, the technology set, the consumer adoption of their many parts of the world, your study highlights the rate at which it's happening in India, and, and I was surprised to see Indonesia as a number one in that, and then the rest are really in a different uh, league. So that reality is around us, 